Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, for 60 years now, the authorities have told us we should eat less fat, more carbohydrate, and if we are eating less saturated fat, more unsaturated fat like trans fats. And this has been terrible advice, which has at the very best coincided with this epidemic of diabetes and obesity, and at worst has been causative rather than associative. The extraordinary thing about this huge collective public error is that the person who has done more than anybody else to explode it, Nina, is neither a scientist, nor a doctor, nor a nutritionist. And in fact, perhaps it's necessary that she is, in fact, an investigative journalist. And perhaps it did take someone from completely outside the field to recognize that the entire field was flawed. We're incredibly lucky that she's come to talk to us today. And I welcome her on your behalf. Nina, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is lovely introduction and thank you for having me Cato. Hello to the audience um, and um, all the people who are watching online or maybe just one of you. Um, but <laughs> um, so great. Uh, so I got into this um, field because I wrote this book uh, called The Big Fat Surprise and it has uh, the central thesis of the book is, is what Taryn so eloquently described, which is that it seems that the government had, and our health authorities had really gotten it completely wrong on fat, and especially saturated fat. Uh, you know, the kind of fat, the reason we avoid meat and cheese and whole, whole milk. Um, so I wrote this book. Um, when I started, um, I, like everybody else, was uh, pretty much everybody else, was following our current dietary recommendations. These are them. Depending on your age, you probably, most of you probably grew up on the, the food pyramid. You know, this is the food pyramid that we've all lived off of. And you can see that it recommends, that big bottom slab there is recommending that we, the bulk of our calories really come from grains. Um, uh, so, you know, bread, pasta, rice, those are all grains, mainly carbohydrates. Um, and, um, and, you know, this has been, this has sort of been our, like, our Bible in terms of every, everybody, every school child gets this, everybody learns it, every doctor teaches this, uh, every nurse, uh, every nutritionist, every dietitian. Um, so, and I followed this religiously. I used to bake my own seven grain bread every day and make my own pasta salads every day for lunch. And I would jog or bike or swim at least an hour every day. And um, I got fat. Um, <laughs> I got fatter than this, but I'm not showing you that photo. Um, it's bad enough to show you this photo with that terrible haircut. Um, but I was, you know, I really tried very hard. I was a vegetarian um, for over 25 years, not a strict vegetarian, but I had no red meat, no butter, um, barely any cheese. Uh, I'm from um, Berkeley, California, so um, <laughs> of course I was a vegetarian. Um, and then from there I moved from to New York City, other capital of vegetarianism. So, you know, I really came to this with zero preconceptions as a journalist. Um, I really never thought I would end up putting a piece of red meat on the cover of a, of a book, um, much less eat any myself. But what happened was is that I got assigned an article by a magazine. I was a freelance journalist and was assigned an article to write about trans fats in the early 2000s. Well, what was trans fats? I didn't know what they were. I hadn't really studied anything about it. But I, um, I, that took me into the world of dietary fat. Um, and you know, fat is what we have obsessed about most in terms of our diet for Americans. Low fat, non-fat, good fat, bad fat, high fat. I mean, we have just, it has been a central preoccupation of our dietary guidelines and therefore of all of us. And I discovered all sorts of things that really as a journalist made my ears perk up, like talking, calling up scientists and saying, uh, I can't talk to you about fat. 
<laughs> and hanging up on me. Or um, people, I mean, sci scientists, real scientists at reputable universities, or scientists telling me they had been visited by officials from the margarine industry and told to yank papers from journals, or editors told to get rid of, you know, to, to pre-publication, to take that paper out of a journal. And I thought, um, you know, sometimes I would hang up the phone after these phone calls and sort of be shaking like, am I investigating the mob or <laughs> am I investigating nutrition science? What is going on? And I just, you know, as a journalist, you realize there's just a very big story out there. Um, and this took me, I read thousands and thousands of scientific papers. I interviewed hundreds of the top experts around the world. And it took me a very long time. It took me almost a decade of my life to try to get to the bottom of this story. Um, I should say that I do not receive any industry funding and never have. Um, and so that's the only disclosure that I have. Um, one of the things that really interested me when I started my research is how do you explain this? What happened in 1980 that American obesity just shoots upwards? Um, that's very strange. Obesity is fairly low in the 1970s or, or not too aggressive, and then something happens to take it tick sharply upwards. In fact, if you go back and look at pictures in the 1970s, you know, go look at the line of kids waiting to watch the latest Star Wars movie come, that's come out. Like, they are all thin, not one fat kid among them. And then, you know, now we live in a much different world. What happened in 1980? Well, I want to tell you a story, uh, the story I tell in my book in a very abbreviated way of just how do we come to believe what we believe about fat and saturated fat and cholesterol. So it all starts in the 1950s. Um, you can see that chart that's uh, on your uh, right. That is the rising tide, the sharply rising tide of heart disease in America, which was terrifying. Uh, President Eisenhower himself has a heart attack in 1955, is out of the Oval Office for 10 days. That is a huge uh, and terrifying event for everybody. And just imagine, you know, men are dying in the prime of their life, right and left, and this had not happened to their fathers. This was something entirely new. And it was really important that people try to understand why is this happening. Well, there were a number of uh, ideas about it. Maybe it was vitamin deficiency, maybe it was auto exhaust, maybe it was that famous type A personality, you know, you yell all the time and then you just keel over with a heart attack. Um, these were all viable hypotheses. But there was one hypothesis proposed by this man, Ansel Keys, a pathologist at the University of Minnesota, and what he came up with with what was called his diet heart hypothesis. And his idea was that you would eat saturated fat and cholesterol in your diet, so it's meat, cheese, dairy, uh, and you would. This would lead to your having uh, elevated cholesterol in your blood, serum cholesterol. This would clog your arteries like uh, cold oil, hot oil down a cold stovepipe, and would give you a heart attack. That was his hypothesis. Um, and it turns out that he was just a very kind of outsized personality. He was very aggressive. I mean, he was called arrogant and a bully, even by his friends. And he could was said that he could argue anyone to the death. He was fiercely a believer in his hypothesis. And he was able to get himself onto the, to the uh, nutrition committee of the American Heart Association, which you see here. That was, at the time, the, really the only public health group that was dealing with heart disease. Uh, and, and, and everybody was following their advice. In 1960, they came up with a paper saying, we really would like to tell the American public what to do to avoid heart disease, but there's no data. Uh, Ansel Keys gets on the nutrition committee. And one year later, with no greater data in hand, he's able to get this recommendation published, which says you need to restrict your saturated fat and cholesterol in order to prevent heart disease. And this is the first advice anywhere in the world telling people to cut back on saturated fat and cholesterol. Uh, this is what I sort of think of like the little acorn that grew into the giant oak tree of advice that we have today. This is where this idea first became institutionalized. Um, so this meant in practice that you cut out uh, animal foods. Um, and I mean, sort of the easiest thing to imagine here is replacing butter with margarine. You replace it with 
you replaced your saturated fats with unsaturated fats, right? So instead of butter, which is saturated, you have margarine, which comes from polyunsaturated vegetable oils. And I think it's harder to imagine what you, how you have vegetable oils instead of meat for dinner, but that was the idea. Um, and we just have to go back in history for a second to remember what were the original fats that people cooked with. I mean, vegetable oils came later before people cooked with tallow, which comes from beef, and suet, which comes from um, sheep. And they mainly, the two main fats that, that European populations used and Americans used before 1900s was lard and butter. Lard is from pigs, obviously, and butter. Um, and oils did not come onto the scene. They were, they were actually the first oil that was sort of used was um, whale oil that was used to, it was used to fuel the industrial revolution. Who was going to keep all those machines lubricated? They used whale oil. When they killed off all the whales, they started to use cottonseed oil. Uh, and then in the early 1900s, somebody looked at cottonseed oil and figured out a way to harden it and said, hmm, that looks a lot like lard. <laughs> Why don't we try to sell that to Americans to eat? And that was Crisco. And that came into the American food supply in 1911. And sure, and after that came ve regular vegetable oils. But these are new foods that used to be used to lubricate machinery and still are. Um, but in any case, Ansel Keys really won the day. I mean, the way to understand him is that it was a moment of complete panic in the United States. There was a demand for some kind of answer. He walked into this vacuum with a very strong idea, and uh, his idea became adopted by the American Heart, Heart Association. And he was easily the most influential, he still is the most influential nutrition scientist in the history of nutrition science. So, and here he is on the cover of Time Magazine in 1961, the same year of that American Heart Association recommendation. But what was the evidence at the time? Well, it really amounted to one study that he uh, himself had did called the Seven Country Study. Um, and it was funded by NIH in part. Um, I'm just going to... So this is what it was. It was a, a survey of nearly 13,000 men and women in seven countries around the world, mainly in Europe, but also in the US and Japan. And he looked at, Ansel Keys and his team went around and they looked at serum cholesterol levels and they looked at diet. And you know, Ansel Keys had gone into this study thinking, I want to prove my hypothesis. And he did, in the end, uh, show a very weak correlation between saturated animal fats and your risk of having a heart attack. Um, and if you read, if you are unfortunate enough to read uh, 10,000 nutrition studies as I have done, I would say 90% of them telescope back to Ansel Keys's seven country study. It is the, one of the most cited works ever. And, it was, and it's because it was really the only study of its day and because it launched 1,000 ships. And he, so I took, I spent an enormous, inordinate amount of time looking into the details of this study. I'm just going to give you a couple highlights of its methodological weaknesses. For one, it only measured the diets of fewer than 3% of its participants, which is nowhere near a statistically representative sample. So it really didn't know what these people were eating. Um, number two, it was, um, it was, a, 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 a kind, the kind of study that only shows association and not causation. So it really can't ever prove that reducing animal fats was what caused the reduction in heart attacks. Number three, it didn't actually show that, that there was a reduced total mortality. So people weren't dying, dying of heart attacks, and maybe they were dying of something else. Anyway, I want to share with you one particular other methodological flaw, which I think is really more emblematic than anything else, which is that it had to do with the islanders of Crete. So these are the people on whom the whole Mediterranean diet came to be based. Ansel Keys looked at the dietary records of about 32 or 33 of them. That's the total population he looked at. He went to this island. He fell in love with them because they were just these, seemed to him ideal. They were, they had, they lived this life of a peasant. It was a beautiful, unruined Crete, not the hyper hoteled Crete of today. And, um, but it turns out, if you read the fine print of his study, 
that he went to Crete uh, three times for a week each, and one of those weeks he showed up. Turns out he turned, he turned up during Lent, uh, when everybody <laughs> is avoiding eating animal foods. <laughs> so he no doubt undercounted the um, amount of saturated fats that was being consumed by that population. But as I said, ultimately, the ultimate problem was it was an epidemiological study. It showed association. It could not prove cause and effect. And for those of you who don't really understand what that means, I'm going to give you one quick example about epidemiology. Epidemiology looks at things that are correlated. Many things are correlated. So here we find that the divorce rate in Maine is correlated with your consumption of margarine. So does that mean you should reduce your consumption of margarine to prevent getting divorced? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's what's called a false association. There are many things that are associated with each other, but they do not cause each other. Here's another example. People with yellow fingers tend to die more of lung cancer. We shouldn't avoid yellow fingers at all costs. What causes yellow fingers? Smoking. <laughs> so you may be missing the thing altogether. Um, and I want to say that nutrition scientists in the 1960s, they knew that, that the seven country study was a weak study and that they needed to do random, what's the, a, a, a more rigorous form of science called randomized controlled clinical trials. And they did them. Governments around the world undertook for billions of dollars in randomized controlled clinical trials. Um, and these took place, many, of the, I'm saying Australia and England, and most were in the US, um, but in Finland, in Denmark, uh, sorry, Norway. Um, and many of them took place in uh, mental institutions or hospitals where people were confined. And uh, these are the kind of experiments you cannot do now because they're considered unethical. But the reason that they're such good trials is that you control all the food of everybody in that setting. People are not allowed to go out down to the local bodega. They, you, know, you can see what people are eating. And this is different than the cl many of the clinical trials that you read about today when somebody, they're really just given a diet book and maybe they're given an hour of counseling you know, once a week and they're given a support group, but you really don't know what they're eating. So these were well-controlled trials. There were on tens of thousands of people. I mean, this is a very conservative number I've put up there, uh, the 25,000, it's just, but, but if, you, if you, depending on how you count, you can get up to 50, 60,000 people who were tested in experiments lasting one to 12 years. Um, and what were the results? There has no effect of saturated fats on cardiovascular mortality or total mortality. And this is uh, my summary of it, but I can, um, I'm, uh, there's you know, a Cochrane review on this with the same results, just no effect. Um, so Ansel Keys' hypothesis is actually the most tested hypothesis in the history of nutrition and heart disease. And we can fairly say that the results were null, which is they did not show him to be correct. A recent uh, the largest ever epidemiological study that was ever, that's been done globally. Um, you know, I don't normally quote epidemiological studies, but I do when they have contrary results. And this is one that uh, is a truly global study. They found that the more saturated fat people ate, they're, the lower their risk of stroke. Um, so that's a contrary result. And here, this is Salim Youssef, who is the immediate past president of the World Heart Federation, saying, I think we got it wrong on saturated fats. The other worrisome thing about these studies that I've, uh, I've just listed is that in a number of them, nearly a dozen of them, they had this side effect. This is the results in one of them where you can see that the people who lowered their saturated fat, they, they, uh, they died at much higher rates of cancer. And this was a consistent finding across all these studies. The people who had gone on the diets higher in vegetable oils and eating the margarine and the soy-filled milk and the soy-filled burgers were all dying at higher rates of cancer. And the NIH was so concerned about this. In the early 1980s, they had four meetings. Uh, they held four high-level meetings. Ansel Keys went, his colleagues all went, and they discussed this side effect of cancer that, that could not be explained. And they could not find... Uh, an answer. But they decided that the reduction of saturated fat and cholesterol was just so important for fighting heart disease that they were basically going to ignore the cancer side effects. Um, there were also huge government trials on the low-fat diet. 
So just remember, Ansel Keys was particularly obsessed with saturated fats, right? He wasn't saying lower your total fat content overall. He was saying switch saturated fats for unsaturated fats. But in 1970, the American Heart Association really said, you know what, let's just lo Ooh. Let's lower all fats because fats are more grams per calorie than either protein or carbohydrate. So if we just lower, now if we just lower the fat content of our diet, we'll save calories. That was the, it was sort of a, an untested theory. But they, um, they started recommending it to the American population and, um, and subsequently, that's not how policy is supposed to work, you know. <laughs> You're supposed to do the clinical trials first and then do the policy. But it happened in the reverse fashion. When they finally did clinical trials, including the Women's Health Initiative and two Boeing trials, these are just two of, of quite a large number. Um, they didn't ta start taking place until the late 1990s, by the way. They could not find that the low-fat diet had any ability to fight obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, or any kind of cancer. And in fact, if people lowered their fat too much, they found that it actually made their HDL, which is their good cholesterol, go down, and that meant they were actually increasing their risk of heart disease. And that is why we no longer, how many people here know that we no longer have a low-fat diet recommendation? Well, that's pretty good. So, you know, the American Heart Association in 2013 and the U.S. Dietary Guidelines in 2015, those are our two major sources of nutrition guidelines, they have dropped any low-fat language. So we don't actually have a low-fat diet anymore. And they recognized that uh, the reason was it doesn't lower your risk of heart disease and, in fact, may worsen it. Um, oh. So why is this not more widely known? Um, you know, people say to me, oh, you don't have any science degrees, and that is true. Um, I did do pre-med and <laughs> thought I would become a doctor. But um, I studied politics, and I often say to people, to understand the history of this story, you must, it is really at least half a story of politics. Um, and this is sort of my general politics of nutrition slide, because I can't get into it in great detail, but it shows you, that's Ansel Keys, um, who's seated uh, on the left there, and you know that nutrition science really was run by a very small group of men, um, and all these, uh, these um, uh, sort of the National Institutes of Health, the American Heart Association, and then the US government was on board, they really controlled the nutrition agenda. And if you didn't agree with them, you couldn't get grant funding, it was very hard to get your papers published, it's very hard to get, uh, you weren't invited to conferences, and so they really controlled the agenda. I mean, I have many stories and interviews from scientists saying to me, uh, you know, I tried to challenge Keys, but you know, then I, I, my, I was told by NIH um, secretary that if I continued to do that, I would lose my grant funding. And then his grant funding disappeared. So, I mean, it was a very real threat to, uh, to scientists to be critics of this. Um, and also, the people who believed in this, um, you know, the, the, this is... The people who believed in this hypothesis, Ansel Keys obviously believed in it, but there was a whole kind of group who, around him who strongly, strongly really believed their hypothesis. And so there was this kind of selection of data going on where they really, I think, genuinely just did not see data to the contrary. This is called in science, it's called selection bias, uh, where you select things that agree with your, your opinion and you disregard things that don't. I mean, we all do this. Where this is this normal human uh, kind of instinct, which is you see the things you want to see, and you just don't see those other things. But scientists are taught to think differently and be different. They're taught to distrust themselves, and they are taught to try to prove themselves wrong. So this clearly did not happen in nutrition. I, this slide that I have up is, I think, the most incredible example of selection bias that I ever found, which was this was the largest the Minnesota Coronary Survey was the largest ever test on Ansel Keys' hypothesis. It took place in five Minnesota mental hospitals, so well controlled. They controlled the diet. It was on more than 9,000 men and women, one of the few studies to include women. Half the people were put on a diet that was considered average in saturated fats at the time, which was 18%, which would seem like outrageous to us now. But, you know, regular milk, regular meat, cheese, 
The other half were put on 9% saturated fat, which is about what we're recommended to eat now, so soy-filled milk, soy-filled cheese. At the end of four and a half years of that experiment, this was their conclusion. There was no difference in the treatment and the control groups. Um, and, and subsequently, actually, some researchers from NIH went back and looked at the original tapes that were in the basement from this study, the original magne magnetic tapes, and, and reanalyzed them and found out that actually the more the men lowered their cholesterol, the greater their risk of dying from heart disease. And that had never been published in this original paper. So those findings were not published. These original findings were not published for 16 years. This is an NIH-funded study. Findings are not published for, for 16 years, and then they're put in this out-of-the-way paper that they know nutritionists will not read. And this is pictured here as Ivan France, who is one of the, the project investigators. And when he was asked much later by a journalist, well, how come you didn't publish the results? He said, well, there was nothing wrong with the study. We were just so disappointed in the way it came out. Which in science, I have to tell you, is a kind of lying. <laughs> All right, so how does this become our official dietary guidelines and our official government policy? Uh, in the late 1970s, Senator George McGovern had a select Senate committee on, uh, on nutrition, and they were mainly looking at undernutrition, but they decided to look at these new killer diseases coming up, heart disease, and now cancer was on the rise. And he uh, published this, that committee published this report um, there's quite an amazing story about how this report came to be published. It was written by one Senate staffer with no background in nutrition who was sort of on his way to becoming a vegetarian and, um, and you know, didn't know about the subtleties of epidemiology versus randomized controlled clinical trials, very much influenced by the American Heart Association. So they published this report, and that is what becomes our dietary guidelines. That's the basis of our dietary guidelines. And that my friends, is what happened in 1980. Um, now this is just a correlation. It's not causation. It's a suggestive correlation. <laughs> there is, you cannot say from this chart alone that the dietary guidelines caused obesity. I think there are, there are a number of other scientific studies that give weight to that case. Um, but it is, uh, it is a very inconvenient correlation for the people who crafted our guidelines. Um, I, I, I want to talk to you about what is the evidence behind our guidelines. Um, and so I wrote this story for the BMJ, um, and it, it actually went to the, back to the most recent dietary guidelines. You know, the guidelines come out every five years. So the last set came out in 2015, and it came out right as my book was coming out. Um, and I went to read the expert report, and I was like, well, well, where is all the science that I've been studying? It just wasn't there. Like, it was nothing. There was no science in the, in the report that I, that I knew about. So I, I went and I looked at, um, I went and I looked at every single study that was cited to, to support the dietary recommendations that we are all currently following today. Okay, so these are, these are the USDA's three dietary patterns. There's the US style, which is really DASH, if you know what DASH, the dietary to uh, stop hypertension. It's the Mediterranean diet and the vegetarian diet. You can see in terms of their macronutrient makeup, they're all pretty much the same. And you would basically call this a low-fat diet. Low-fat diets have been described as being anywhere between 30, 30, 25 to 35 percent fat. Um, so it's still a low-fat diet, even though they're not calling it a low-fat diet. Um, and that means that you're eating over 50% of your calories as carbohydrates. This is just another chart showing in a slightly different way that you can see that in terms of the daily recommendations of food groups, that the, the diets are all very, very similar. Um, so I went and looked at, you know, what are, what, where, where's the evidence for these dietary patterns that we're all following? Okay, so, um, so the first one is, and I only looked at the major diseases that they're looking at. What is the relationship between dietary patterns and risk of cardiovascular disease? So um, what was their source of data for that? Well, they studied the PREDIMED trial, which is this huge trial on the Mediterranean diet that has been retracted. 
uh, and reissued, but with so many problems that it's really the basic evidence has been called seriously under que into question. And then the DASH trials, all the DASH trials. Let me tell you something that most people don't know about the DASH trials. They have only, DASH diet has only been tested on 1,200 people total in experiments lasting no longer than five months long. They have never sh been shown to be able to help people lose weight. They do reduce your blood pressure if you have high blood pressure. And they will reduce your LDL cholesterol, which is your bad cholesterol. But at the same time, they also reduce your good cholesterol, your HDL. So at best, they're kind of a wash for heart disease. And the evidence is very thin. And that is the entire clinical trial base for this dietary pattern, this, this recommending our dietary patterns. OK, oh, this is just the dash. I didn't realize I had a slide on this. Oh, I can tell you this. Mostly middle-aged men they tested. Uh, most trials lasting no longer than eight weeks. So um, next question, what about body weight? Meaning, can the dietary patterns help you lose weight? Here they've cited only one trial on 180 subjects. That's the total evidence base for, the, uh, for this recommendation, that any of those dietary patterns will help you lose weight. And now I'm saying when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you need to follow a Mediterranean diet, this is the only, <laughs> to lose weight, this is the only trial that that doctor will be able to cite. Um, and they didn't lose much more weight, right? Uh, they had about, well, what is that in pounds? Five, six pounds. Um, OK, so let's go on to diabetes. Can the dietary patterns help you reverse your diabetes, fight type 2 diabetes or type 1? Zero. There are zero clinical trials to support this. Um, so that's pretty bad evidence. What about the vegetarian diet? That is the new diet that they came up with in 2015 to recommend to all Americans. They could find no randomized controlled clinical trial to support the health benefits of that diet. I know it's very popular, and probably everybody in the room knows somebody on this diet right now, but um, there are no clinical trials to support its health benefits. And they overall, when they looked at all the data, they had to give it the lowest rank uh, that they could possibly give for available data. So this is quite a surprise, because one of the things that, it, um, uh, that I did recently was look at the publication history of every of the 14 people in this expert committee who wrote this report. And, um, and before they were chosen for the committee, 11 out of 14 of them, uh, which I think is around almost 80%, but um, 11 out of 14 of them had published histories saying they believed the vegetarian diet was the best diet, or now they call it a plant-based diet. So they came into the committee with a bias for the vegetarian diet. Uh, they couldn't find any evidence for it, but they recommended it anyway. Um, so what is the evidence for the dietary patterns? Why, do we, why, are, we, <laughs> why are we all following them? Um, and the answer is it's all epidemiological. It's all this weak epidemiological data. Um, uh, so this was something that, um, that was sort of confirmed in a uh, report by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, who took, uh, they did really the first ever outside peer review of the dietary guidelines. The report came out in 2017. And they came to the conclusion that really, they, um, they were not prioritizing the science correctly, and they lacked scientific rigor, and they lacked transparency, and they suffered from bias. Um, so that just tells a story that uh, you know, our dietary guidelines were born out of weak science and remain weak science. Um, and this is not what we're told, though. I mean, what, this, is, this is what we're told. This is what the, you know, I think the mainstream uh, journalists and experts will tell you this story, which is that it is your fault, America, that you're fat and sick because you fail to follow the guidelines and you don't exercise enough. Well, I'm a journalist, and I thought, okay, maybe that is true. I, you know, I should go and look at that data and see what that data says. And here's what the data says. Actually, this is the best available government data that you can find on this subject, and it shows you what the trends are in food consumption. I don't know if you can see this, but... Um, so Americans eat 20% more fresh vegetables, 35% more fresh fruits, 28% more grains than today than in, 
the, the, the years are from 1970 to 2014. We eat 87% more ve vegetable oils. So they're all, those are all the blue lines going up. So everything we've been told to eat more of, we eat more of. Uh, and then the red lines going down are everything we've to been told to eat less of. We eat less of. Uh, we eat, <laughs> I can't even see that number. Um, but I think it's um, about 25% less red meat. I know that we eat 34% less beef now. Whole milk is down by 79%. Eggs are down. Animal fats are down by 27%. Butter is down. And this is not a cherry-picked set of food groups here. I can tell you that in every category you check, for you know, fish, we eat more fish, we eat more nuts, we in everything that we are supposed to eat more of, we eat more of. You know, and the vegetable category is not ketchup. That is the, the biggest increase in in uh, vegetable consumption has been in leafy greens. So we've done a pretty good job of following the guidelines, I'd say. And this also turns comes out in terms of macronutrients. We were told to increase our carb consumption. Uh, and we did. Carbs are up by 30%. We were told to decrease fat. We did that, down by 25%. Um, and um, I would say the more reliable numbers are from 1971. But, um, but still, you can see the trends. We did, and we did follow in big macronutrient patterns, we, we followed the guidelines. What about on exercise? Is it the fact that we don't exercise as much as we used to? Well, according to the latest, one of the latest reports by the US CDC, ex Americans are exercising more than we used to. So we are now, we 50, more than half of us are meeting the government's physical activity guidelines, and that's up from 41% in 2005. And so people are increasingly saying, there's another report that says that, you know, that looked at sedentary behavior, that could not find any evidence that sedentary behavior leads to obesity. It doesn't mean that it's not true, but they just couldn't find any evidence for it, which is good news in the meantime for us couch potatoes. Uh, but as people, experts are increasingly saying, you really cannot exercise your way out of a bad diet. It's really that, that, that obesity and other diseases are really driven by nutrition. So what are the nutritional options? You know, look, the Ansel Keys' diet was tested, results came up null. Low fat diet, tested, results did not show any benefit. Well, there is now a new idea about diet, a new hypothesis about what causes obesity and other diseases, and it's called the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis. And it holds that carbohydrates, really of any kind, even those health, healthy whole grains, in your body, they become glucose. Your body understands all of that as glucose, which is sugar. That triggers the release of, pan of insulin from the pancreas. And insulin is like the king of all hormones for making you fat. So you take insulin plus glucose, and that is stuck away in your fat cells. And if you have carbohydrates all day long, if you're having cereal for breakfast, and then your blood spikes, your sugar spikes, and then you're hungry mid-morning, and you have, uh, maybe you have a piece of fruit, and then your sugar spikes, and then at lunch you have a sandwich, and then mid-afternoon snack is some uh, crackers or gummy bears, and then for dinner you're having pasta. That is carbohydrates all day long, and over time your ability to produce insulin and respond to insulin and your body's ability to deal with insulin is just exhausted you become what's called hyperinsulinemic, or uh, you, you, just, you're, you can no longer process the insulin, and that is when you become type 2 diabetic. You have to shoot yourself up with insulin because your body can no longer deal with it. It no longer responds to the amount of insulin that itself can produce. So what is the evidence supporting this new theory? Uh, well, quite a lot. More than 100 randomized controlled clinical trials on more than 7,000 people. Some of them are what we consider, you know, quite a few, more six of them are two years long. That's considered long enough to flush out any side effects. Some of you probably knew this originally as the Atkins diet. It used to be thought it would lead to renal failure and bone loss and uh, other kinds of side effects. None of that, that would have been seen in the two-year trials, and none of those side, of side effects turned out to be true. Um, low carb nearly always results in more weight loss. Maybe not dramatically, but always more. Um, and it's accomplished without any hunger or calorie counting, which is always one of these kind of unrecognized 
aspects about a low carbohydrate diet because like what if your doctor said and said I'm going to give you you have two pills to choose from. This pill is going to make you hungry, irritable, tired, cranky, um, and constantly think about food all the time. And this pill has no side effects. <laughs> Which one would you choose? You choose, the, you choose the pill. You choose the diet that doesn't make you hungry, doesn't make you tired, doesn't lead to you know, lowered metabolism. So, um, and there are, there's more than one experiment now that shows that, um, that the diet can reverse type 2 diabetes quite quickly. Uh, the, the largest trial on this showed 60% reversal of diabetes in one year. Um, and by that, I mean that it, it, the average blood glucose of these people fell below the diabetic diagnosis, so they were no longer diagnosed as diabetes. That does not mean it's a cure. If they start eating carbohydrates again, they'll get their diabetes back. Um, a study just came out showing it could reverse fatty liver disease, uh, and it improves most cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, I hear you cry. Yes, but we eat more calories. It's about the calories. It must be that we eat more calories. Um, and it's true. We eat more calories now than we did uh, 30 years ago. But all those calories practically are carbohydrates. So we cannot from this information alone say it's just the calories. It could be the carbohydrates. Um, so looking at all that, uh, I founded a group called the Nutrition Coalition, uh, which is based here in DC. And our work is simply to try to get the guidelines to be evidence-based. It, it's very simple. We just want them to be based on randomized controlled clinical trials on humans and not on this weak epidemiological evidence because we believe that uh, this would allow people to get healthy again. Um, and the reason that we're focused on the guidelines is they are incredibly powerful. <laughs> I know probably throughout this whole you know, talk you're thinking, I don't go to a .gov website to find out my dietary advice. I go to the internet or I ask my doctor. But look how powerful the guidelines are. They control all the uh, your school lunch programs, feeding programs for the elderly. Um, they control women and infant children, what's fed to them. Those are the biggest budget line in USDA budget. They control all the K through 12 education. They are downloaded virtually by all the medical, all the associations, the diabetes association, the medical association, nutritionists, and, and the nurse association. And then there, so at every point of contact with patients in every office, in every setting, you're being told the guideline. You're being taught the guidelines. Uh, they direct food for the military. We now have an obesity problem in the military. And they changed the whole food supply. So all of cattle were bred to be leaner. Uh, that's why we have lean, on, pretty much only lean meat in the supermarkets and, and led to the creation of thousands and thousands of low-fat products. They are really powerful. And it's a problem, uh, you know, and, and they haven't been helpful. Let's just say, <laughs> the least we could say is they have not been helpful. Um, and I want to, uh, you know, I also want to say about them that they are really, they remain this one size fits all diet. And, you know, one of our goals is, is simply to say, you know, beyond there being evidence based, we really need a diversity of diets. And everybody in this room ha is different and, and has unique and different kinds of nutritional needs, responds to diet very differently. Children have different nutritional needs, the elderly have different nutritional needs, people who are obese or have diabetes or heart disease have a metabolic issue that requires a different diet. So currently our dietary guidelines are only for healthy Americans. Did you know that? So that applies to about less than 20% of America is still considered metabolically healthy. So that is something else that really needs to change. Um, and, and the final thing that needs to change is the dietary guidelines are currently, they do not meet nutritional adequacy goals for potassium, magnesium, choline, uh, and something I'm forgetting. But I mean, it, they should meet nutritional adequacy goals because people need nutrients in order to uh, avoid disease and to grow and healthfully reproduce. So that's the goal of the Nutrition Coalition. It should be all of our goal. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so I thank you for having me here today. I think I've landed on time, Terrence. Uh, so um, we wanted to have plenty of time for your questions. And so I'd like to welcome any questions that you have, especially the hard ones. <laughs> You over here. 
Yeah, the dietary guidelines may have conformed for 2020. Are you happy with the composition and what they're planning to do? So the question is that the Dietary Guideline Committee has been formed for the 2020 guidelines. It was just announced last week, and am I happy with it? That is a complicated question. It's a 20-person committee. It is definitely more diverse than any committee has been in the past. There is an expert there who is an expert in animal proteins. That's never been the case. Um, there is um, there's somebody who is, I wouldn't say an true expert in low carbohydrate diets, but is somebody who's knowledgeable about them and has uh, done low carbohydrate diet experiments and is open to them. Um, that said, there is, uh, there is a Seventh-day Adventist who, as a matter of religious belief, whole, believes in a vegetarian diet, and I don't believe we should be mixing religion with uh, good science or policy. Um, and find me somebody who does. <laughs> And there are, you know, there are quite a few people on the committee who are really strong old guard people who have, you know, who have served on the committee before, instrumental in creating the committee, long, long time, people who have been um, employed by the USDA, employed by FDA, so very, very close to the government. Um, and those will be the heavy hitters on the committee. So I just don't know, the question is, how much can these sort of outsider or up and comers have their voices be heard? Uh, yes, in the back. I've been involved in a number of nonprofits. I'm looking for a new mission. Oh, great. Uh, Sign us up. How are things coming at the coalition? <laughs> uh, I don't know if your mic is on, but the question is, uh, he's a uh, gentleman in the back is looking for a, a new nonprofit, and how are we doing at the Nutrition Coalition? Well, we're solvent. Um, we were responsible for that National Academy of Sciences report that was the first ever outside peer review of the, of the guidelines. That was pretty much, that was our work. I mean, nobody can say anything for sure, but, um, but we proposed it. Um, and so that I think is quite an accomplishment. We uh, actively um, educated people at USDA about the need to include in their topics for this year, the low carbohydrate diet and saturated fat as topics that needed to be reviewed, and they did. So um, again, you never are sure if you've done something, but I know that we're, we, are, we are really the only group in the world right now that is advocating for evidence-based guidelines. I mean, we're it. Um, the, the, there's a tremendous kind of bottom-up movement of people who have gotten healthy by ignoring the guidelines, uh, and so, but there, you know, and there, there are hundreds, and we have we have uh, maybe 500 doctors signed up with us, who and, and many many PhDs signed up with us who believe in our mission, but um, it really hasn't translated into an advocacy effort until our group was formed. So we could use your support. <laughs> yes, woman in purple. I did cut out carbohydrates and my blood sugar did go down. However, I've had high cholesterol for a long time. Should I take cholesterol medication or do you suggest anything else? Uh, so I want to say that um, one of the... One of the chapters that is, or one of the sections of my book that is worth reading is how women and the data on women and children have been, has been ignored. Uh, and how the data for women and children is very different than it is for middle-aged men. And one of the findings that came out of the very earliest uh, uh, studies that looked at risk factors found that women, especially women over 50, um, the higher their cholesterol, the longer they lived. But that finding, in an effort to just sort of simplify the message, that finding for women was just ignored. So, I shouldn't so if you have, I mean, unless you have, you know, there are, there are people with something called familial hypercholesterolemia, which is super high cholesterol, and they are, that's a genetic defect, and uh, treatment for that might be different. But if you are regular garden variety high cholesterol, that is a good sign if you are a woman. <laughs> yes, that's good. Okay. All right, I think there's somebody in the back there who's had their hand raised for a while in the green cap. 
or we might as well do those two in the back. Thanks so much. A uh, question about high fructose corn syrup, which is generally entering to almost every processed food, uh, and I hear that it's used to fatten cattle, but that is going throughout the food supply. So would you like to comment on that? Is that something you... Yeah, I mean, high about? fructose corn syrup, uh, you know, high fructose corn syrup uh, is really not that much different from sugar. Um, it's just one is in a, it, and, the, and the evidence to show that it's really so much worse for health is, is, is not that strong. I mean, sugar is, uh, Ted, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's, sugar is like 50% glucose, 50% fructose, high fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose and 45% glucose. Is that a difference that really has a huge metabolic effect on the body? It's not really clear. Um, so in general, I mean, I want to say something about sugar versus grains. What fattens cattle is, what are they, how do they fatten cattle? Anybody know? They feed them grains. <laughs> that's what happens. And that's why they go into feedlots, because just eating grass does not fatten cattle that efficiently. So they stick them on a feedlot, and they give them grains. So remember the big bottom slab of the food pyramid, what fattens humans? <laughs> Could very well be all those grains, or grains plus sugar. Um, but I'm not convinced truly by the evidence to show that high fructose corn syrup is so much worse than just regular sugar. Uh, I think he's had his hand up for a while. And then maybe down here, you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah. I actually had a little different comment, but to build on what you just said about fattening, the animals uh, in a feedlot, the, the way you get them fat is to feed them more grain. The way you get them to eat more grain is to actually put less salt density in the grain because there is an inherent appetite for salt. And so that's how they get them to eat more grain, which gets me to the other question that I wanted to get to, which is, uh, first of all, congratulations. I think you nailed the the political machinations, and uh, I'm more familiar with the salt uh, questions than the fat ones, but it's the same story, and only the actors' names changes. Uh, uh, <laughs> but the uh, question I had was, are you familiar with the latest research on the neural control of appetites? Uh, there's a study that came out on, in the uh, a New England Journal uh, just two to three weeks ago where it pointed out that for water, for, uh, what was the third one I've got here? Water, salt, and uh, for food generally, uh, quantities of uh, calories are driven by appetites modulated by the brain activity. So if you're not familiar with it, I'll share this story with you. It's, uh, it's a fascinating story because there, as I said, uh, a, a, a cow or a, a steer will have a inherent appetite for salt, and that's how you deliver uh, antibiotics too, because you can meter it. But it's uh, it's there because the brain tells the body keep eating, and right. that's why when you go to a low sodium diet, as opposed to maybe a low-fat diet too, but a low-sodium diet, people will keep eating the same amount of sodium. And that, you showed the chart about how we follow the guidelines. Salt is unchanged in the entire uh, time of, uh, of that guideline. Except but, for in the school lunch program where it's been required now to go down. I'm sorry? Well, no, sorry, finish your point and then I'll... Okay, well, the, the point I was making, I think, was that uh, it's controlled by the brain, and the brain will uh, tell people to keep eating whatever amount, and it varies by individual, their body needs. And therefore, if they try to choose low-sodium foods, they'll just end up eating more foods. Uh, so yes, that is right. I mean, the, 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 the brain regulates appetite, and it's it, you, the way I think about it is the body, you know, your body requires certain nutrients to survive. And if your body is not getting those nutrients, it sends a message up to the brain, eat more. So if you, what I was saying is that, you know, that 
under the guidelines, because they have they've reduced salt, say in the school lunch programs, that that means there there will be reduced uh, salt in, in any of the USDA feeding assistance programs, and that means that kids are likely will then if they can get it, you know, eat more food because they need the salt. It's true of other foods too, and and. That's one of the reasons why people, when they reduce carbohydrates and they increase fat and protein, in, in mainly in animal foods, say, they, uh, they won't eat as much or they won't, what you know is a sort of a tautological term, but they won't overeat. Um, and that's because their body is getting, those foods contain the nutrients that they need and the fat that they need to be healthy. So they find that, but that the way to talk about it is they say fat and protein are more satiating and they fill you up. And they've done experiments on subjects where they put a stack of pork chops in front of people and say, you know, eat, you must eat these. People cannot overeat in pork chops or steak. They're just like, I'm full. <laughs> I'm really full and I can't eat anymore. But you know what it's like to open a bag of cookies or crackers or popcorn or crisps or, you know, whatever. You can, you can eat that stuff forever. And I know because I used to live on rice cakes. Uh, and I could just never get to the bottom of the number of rice cakes that I could eat because I wasn't getting the nutrients that my body needed. So your body is sending up that continual message, just keep eating until you get what you need to feel satiated. And what is satiating is the right amount of nutrients and, 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 and fat and protein so that your body can survive healthfully. So, uh, so anyway, so that's it's, it's a complex subject about appetite, but I think it's basically driven by our basic biological needs. Our bodies are not idiots. You know, these ideas like, oh, go fill yourself up with water before a meal or fill yourself up with celery. Or, your body is not that dumb. It's not going to be filled up with celery. You're just going to get hungry later on and eat something else <laughs> until you give it what it needs to live. Okay, you've been waiting for a while. And then, <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Um, when I looked at some of the write-ups on that study, the only marker that got just a little bit worse was LDLC. Correct. And that's debatable. Okay, whether you should include it at all. The diet that made everyone sicker was the ABA diet. Right. And <laughs> I keep seeing this stuff over and over again. And you pointed out the history of the American Heart Association, why can't the ABA be sued into extinction? Because the amount of human misery that they're responsible for is just unbelievable. I mean, it, it, this topped anything you could talk about in the 19th century with, with, with respect to medicine, okay? And why can't, why can't there, there be something stronger than they get away with it every time? The, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean. What's going on? Why is it so rigged? Um, so first I want to tell everybody about this, a little bit more about this study. It's called the Verda study because uh, it was funded by a company called Verda that made the, uh, the mobile app that, that was used to communicate with patients. Um, and that was a really good way of staying in touch with patients. It's, uh, it's over 300 people who when they entered the study, it's a university-based study at the University of Indiana. When they started the study, they had on average been suffering from diabetes for eight years. That is very unlike other studies where people are pre-diabetic or, or, or in the early stage of diabetes. These people had serious diabetes, they were on multiple medications, and after one year of going on a very low carbohydrate diet, which by the way, they tested with adherence by, by measuring their ketone levels, which showed absolutely you cannot, you cannot get ketones in your blood if you're not on a very low carbohydrate diet. Uh, so they had excellent adherence. 60% had reversed their diagnosis of diabetes. And compared to the control group, which followed the American Diabetes Association diet, they have 0.1% reversal. And that's because the American Diabetes Association tells you eat carbohydrates, but just match it with insulin. So, you know, you're just trying to chase your carbs all day long, matching it with insulin, and then you get ever more insulin. And, and you know, insulin is not a benign drug. It makes you gain weight. Weight also, so you're in this, like, negative loop of gaining weight, getting more diabetic. Um, the American Diabetes Association is almost 100% supported by pharmaceutical companies that make insulin. 
So um, it's just, uh, I mean, I, I think it has just has to be said, it's just a wholly captured <laughs> organization that is not serving the public. And um, why can it not be sued? I don't know that it can't be sued. I was told by one expert that if you have uh, scientists, legitimate scientists who will stand up on both sides of the debate, that they can make the defense that this is scientifically justifiable. There's legitimate scientific debate, and therefore they have they have protection against uh, they have a, a lawsuit. But you know, I would love to see somebody test that <laughs> if there are any lawyers in the room. Uh, here, is it possible for you to go back to uh, your second last slide? Yes. That one? One more. Oh, sorry, one more. Oh, I'm looking for the one where the, the dietary guideline goes in. Uh, what do you, the, the 1980. The, the one that has the... Ob it was one of your first slides, the one, one of your later Obesity, slides. obesity there, going there, up. Right there, right there. Right there. Right there. No, right one, there. there we go. Okay, <clears throat> dietary guidelines go in in 1980. Uh, and in 1981, we have seen a 4% increase in obesity. I don't think people get obese that fast. Uh, so there, so there, something was going on prior to the initiation of the guidelines that was going to predispose people. Which were the American Heart Association recommendations. Was that, was that what it was? Yes. So the official policy, people started to change their eating habits starting with the American Heart Association in, in 1961, they told everybody, they told men to cut back on saturated fat and cholesterol. And then they said, then they expanded that to all people because they were basically, their logic was, it's just easier for a housewife to cook one meal for everyone, so let's all, let's all take care of the dad and, and maybe we're preventing heart disease for everybody else in the family too. In 1970, they start recommending the low fat diet and everybody starts learning through newspapers and magazines and echoing that message to, to start lowering their fat, and they did. I think it is true that that is a very sharp incline that you see there, but you have to remember that the US guidelines, the whole food industry is swiveling around to respond to them, literally. I mean, the USDA puts out a notice saying, we need, in the next two years, we need 3,500 more low-fat products on the shelves, is they, what it, the Federal Register, it says to the, you know, to the whole food industry. And all of cattle start to be, you know, they change all the cattle to be bred to be leaner, and they change everything that's sold in the, sh in the stores. But, but there had been this whole, you're right, there had been 20 years prior where the American Heart Association was getting out these messages, and they're going out through magazines, and and so people are already changing the way they eat. Over here. Hey, I just want to remind you, I think there was also a major milestone in 1977, correct? Um, in terms of like report that was published about the publicity? The, so yeah, 1997 was the, the report by the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition. So, and that came out and there was a lot of, well actually in the years that after, right after that came out, there was a lot of controversy around it. Um, and there was, I would say there were a couple of years where there was just a tremendous amount of debate. Um, but yes, so that was, it definitely sort of brought it all to the fore for the public and made it more, um, all these issues all more known. Good point. All right, you've been waiting for quite a while over here in the corner. The question is, am I calling for a rejection of epidemiological evidence or a more skeptical eye of it? Um, so epidemiology is really a science that is meant to generate hypotheses to be tested. So it really is meant to say like, hey, we found an association between you know, meat and cancer. So uh, let's go out and test that in a clinical trial. That's what it's meant to do. You're not supposed to take the epidemiological finding as a basis for public policy. I mean, the level of certainty that you need to have for public policy of an entire population, uh, it ought to be very high, a very high standard for telling people, you know, you were telling a healthy, in 1980, we were still a fairly healthy population, so 
you're telling a healthy population to change their diet and you need a very high level of evidence. So in general, when you're looking at data, there's these data pyramids that they have. At the top are usually ran, you know, randomized controlled clinical trials or meta-analyses of those trials. At the bottom are epidemiological studies. And the critique of the dietary guidelines is that it's ignored these trials and elevated the epidemiology. Well, so, you know, as, you, as, you, as you suggested, you know, one of the limitations of, you know, the, the clinical trials, you know, is that adherence is difficult to monitor, especially over long term. Uh, the, the populations that are involved are often not representative of the, of the general population. So, uh, uh, again, you know, it, it sounds like you're saying take, you know, epidemi epi evidence off the table rather than considering all of the available evidence given its strengths and its weaknesses. And, and I'm just trying to clarify, you know, it, you know, is the position that you're putting forward that epi, epi should not play a role in this uh, uh, development of this policy? I think for public-wide, population-wide policy recommendations, you need to have more than epidemiology, epidemiology to make them. You need to have replicated, randomized controlled clinical trials on humans because the epidemiology has been shown, demonstrated time and time again to be unreliable. Let me give you an example. Let me tell you what I mean by that, just so everybody understands. In two separate studies where they looked at nutritional epidemiological findings, which include in the past, uh, uh, you know, take vitamin E supplements, hormone replacement therapy, take beta carotene. Um, uh, you know, there's like a, there's a long list of them. When they test those epidemiological findings in rigorous clinical trials, they have been shown to be correct zero to 20% of the time. That means that 80 to 100% of the time they're wrong. So we can't, I don't think it's fair to bet the public health on those kinds of odds. Like, I just think that's irresponsible, and we can see how we have gone wrong because the advice, the, you know, all that the advice not to eat cholesterol in your eggs and your shellfish, and the reason we avoided all those really nutrient dense foods was based on epidemiology. That turned out to be wrong. Uh, same thing with low fat diet, turned out to be wrong. So, I think we cannot, and, and not just wrong, but harmed people. Hormone replacement therapy killed women. So I think that we cannot afford to be that wrong. Like, and we should not, we should not risk our public in these kinds of experiments. It would be better, I mean, according to the medical dictum, it is better to do no harm. So better to remain silent. Uh, man in the back in the corner. So great presentation, thank you very much. Thank you. So a couple questions. Um, first one is, do you follow the Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Esselstyn's perspective on yes. um, heart disease? Do you feel like that somewhat conflicts with what you're advocating for? <laughs> yes. Number two is, yes. do you probably have followed the China study, which yes. you know those people have very high life expectancies and they're mostly vegan. Um, the third thing is, you know, the, the meat and, and, and dairy that are, are forefathers ate is different from the kind of food that we get these days, right? I mean, these cows are laced with hormones and antibiotics. Um, and then also if we bring in sort of where we are with our climate, I know this is Cato and they're not exactly advocates for, for climate change, but you know, it's reality and you know, um, so do, do we think about those things and um, you yes. know, in our diet? So I appreciate yes. your commentary. So, uh so there's a number of uh, arguments about, you know, for the vegan diet. So at the Cleveland Clinic, there's somebody named Caldwell Esselton who recommends a vegan diet. Um, he's done one uncontrolled experiment, uh, so no control group on a very small number of people, and was not well, not not controlled in terms of how he followed up on them. So I think his data is not strong, and it's why the Dietary Guideline Committee didn't cite it. Um, they also did not cite the China study, because that was never published in a peer-reviewed journal, and has been, there's been a number of problems found with that study, which is 
in the end, uh, an epidemiological study, never peer-reviewed, never published in a peer-reviewed paper. So there are problems with that literature. Um, the, um, the question about meat and dairy being different today than they were previously, uh, you know, I think that um, people always have the choice if they have the income to go and get um, you know, higher quality meat and, and higher quality dairy if they, if they feel like that's worth it. I looked personally into the question of whether there are actually hormones in our milk, and they're not. Um, that turns out to be a sort of a, a myth that's been perpetrated by I don't know who, but um, so, you know, if you can afford it, but I mean, I think given the choice of buying conventional meat, which a lot of, uh, you know, still contains folate, selenium, B2, all the B vitamins, zinc, iron, compared to having pasta for dinner, which contains uh, none of those things in their natural form and is full of carbohydrates, I still think the better choice for a family on a budget is, uh, is the meat because it's nutrient dense and it allows children to grow healthfully. Um, this, the question of climate change um, and whether or not meat, animal agriculture drives climate change is I think one, I can just say it's one of unsettled science right now. Uh, there are many things that we, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been promoted by people flying on private jets around the world. <laughs> But no, I mean, I take it as a serious issue. I, it's just that I think that, you know, we need, I mean, my basic point is we need to, we have a tremendous obesity and diabetes crisis in this country. You know, diabetes alone, without even the side effects, cost $322 billion a year. We are unhealthy. We are suffering. It is a huge economic cost. So I think the, the question that I ask myself is, what is the diet that will make us healthy for which we have the evidence that makes us healthy, and how do we make that diet sustainable? We cannot enshrine this diet or the diet, you know, the diet that is making us unhealthy and make that the sustainable diet. That that create that puts in place ever rising rates of obesity and diabetes, which I think is unacceptable or should be unacceptable to us. Uh, I don't know who is next. You here? Thanks for the presentation. You know, as you said, your book is a lot about politics. And there's a lot in your book that, in a way, isn't really limited to nutrition. It's about academia, and it's about rivalries and jealousies and studies and people saying, I can't talk to you about that, and that sort of thing. As a result of your research, do you think we should all have a more skeptical attitude just in general about what is or is not settled science? I mean. Do, does, does it give you a perspective on questions like, and I know this is controversial, you know, the vaccine controversy and whether or not it's such a slam dunk or we shouldn't at least have a grain of, of a skepticism about whether or not that's settled science? Um, if you're asking me if I have any trust left in the world, <laughs> the answer is not very much. Like, I really distrust most claims now that I've seen how science can be distorted and how um, I think the process of doing science is so, uh, it, there's so, it's so deeply flawed, not by the scientists themselves necessarily, but by the way it becomes institutionalized. Hypotheses are adopted by institutions, and then they become the favorite hypotheses, and then it is almost impossible to be a dissenter or a critic. And so the voices of the critics become marginalized. And this is happening at a shockingly fast rate now that we have you know, the, the way that scientists and academic institutions have learned how to play into the media and, and, and do PR for their science and they, because they know that's also how they'll get more research grants. So it does make one, me, very skeptical about the ability to trust science. Um, so unfortunately, yes. <laughs> I, I need to be one of those people that like goes off and lives off the, <laughs> off the grid. Um, yes, over here. I was wondering how, how does fast food uh, fit into all of this because in 1980, besides Reagan becoming president, I think uh, it's when the fast food industry really started to take off. So how does fast food fit into all of this? So yeah, the question about fast food I think is an excellent one, which is we, we have seen over the, you know, we've seen the great rise in manufactured foods. Um, but it really started in the, in the 
um, 20s and 30s, where you know the rise of Standard Biscuit Company and Heinz, and they're all. That's really when those companies started coming into being, and then they really, I, I'm, you know, went into overdrive. I think in the last 30 years, so we're surrounded by what people call a toxic food environment, and it is really hard um, for people to resist that. That's definitely a factor in what's driving obesity. But it's also true that there are many overweight and sick people who are trying really, I'm saying junk food is not the only explanation. Uh, and there are a couple data points that I want to give you on that. Consumption of sugar has actually been dropping since 1999. So has the consumption of refined grains. Consumption of whole grains has been rising since 1999. Those are trends in the right direction, yet we see no difference in obesity. Maybe there's a lag time response, I don't know. Um, and it's also true that there are many, many people who have had non-junk food laden diets. In other words, those nearly 50,000 women who all went on the Women's Health Initiative, they were not told to eat junk food. They were told to eat fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and they did not get any healthier. Uh, this, of course, dovetails with my own experience, making my own bread and having lots of fruits and vegetables and not eating sweets and being extremely good. And, and I only got fatter and sicker. So I think there is, I think that junk food is one component, uh, but it is not the only story here about why we are so unhealthy. Any other questions? Uh, okay, lady in purple in the back. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I keep reading about how vegetarian and vegan diets are good for the planet, you know, because they don't use up as much land and water. I mean, do you have any comments on this? So, you know, I'm not an environmental scientist, so the, you know, the question about vegetarian diets being better for the planet, I think that you can look at, you know, the argument has always been there's, you know, it takes more inputs to create a pound of meat than it does a pound of plants, right? And that's always, so why should we be eating meat? Because this is much cheaper. But if you calculate in, a pound of plants comes with obesity, diabetes, heart disease, maybe cancer. That all of a sudden looks like a very expensive pound of plants. Maybe the, you know, a pound of meat without all the disease would be a better investment of our resources. How about back there in the green hat? Oh, sorry, did I miss you out here? Um, hi, I just wanted to, to kind of piggyback on uh, a question comment from earlier, is that one of the things that, uh, I'm a health fitness by prof in, in that by profession, and one of the things I find incredibly um, disturbing and really frustrating is um, how, like you were saying, these methodologies, methodologies and opinions become institutionalized, and particularly in, um, in the lack of nutrition education in medical professions. Um, like my dad uh, has diabetes, recovered from prostate cancer, is kind of borderline dementia, and I have to argue with him against his own doctor's advice on what he should be eating. Like he's being told, I, I advocate, uh, low carb, higher fat, and it's going against his doctor's advice, his primary care physician, his different doctors. And, you know, um, even uh, w several friends are, are, are doctors, and they have a primary care doctor and an anesthesiologist have the same amount of nutrition education. And it's really, it's, 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 we're up against something like that is so heavily ingrained in, and, and how, how to go about changing that. And yeah. Like what is taught in medical schools? These are people that we are, that we look up to, and yeah, that because they're a doctor, they should they know all the things. Um, but it's 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 so wrong. Well, this is why our strategy for change is to change the guidelines because you know the doctors are are taught the guidelines. I just uh, and they and they must follow. If you're in a large medical practice, you must follow the guidelines or you risk, you know, being sued. You risk it's a medical a lot. We have a doctor in the audience who told me a story says we're, we're not allowed to not teach the guidelines. Another friend of mine who's in medical school and wrote and said, 
I just sat through, you know, they get like one or two days of nutrition training in medical school and then they are taught the guidelines and he says, our teacher is telling me, teaching the guidelines and I just, I just, you know, I'm on a low carb diet and I, and I just can't, I can't believe what he's teaching us. Um, and he went to him after the lecture and said, how come you don't mention anything about, you know, other kinds of dietary patterns? And the professor himself said, well, I myself am on a ketogenic diet, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not allowed to teach you anything else. And that's because of the medical associations, which goes back to the guideline. The guidelines are considered the gold standard. They're considered the gold standard worldwide. And until that changes, it imposes such rigidities on our whole medical system. And I, you know, actually feel sorry for doctors because, you know, it's not their fault. They're really like, they're just doing what they've been told. Um, and and so, you know, but the, but they are, there is a rigidity imposed upon them that they, they you know, most people can't, can't break out of. So I agree, it's a somewhat tragic state of affairs. Yes, thank you very much. We, we've just had 40 to 60 years of collective error destroyed in just 45 minutes of excellent and elegant destruction. It's absolutely brilliant. And the questions could tell how engaged the audience were. Thank you very much for a wonderful, wonderful talk. And then upstairs, there are drinks, and I'm glad to say lots and lots of cheese. Thank you very much. <laughs>